My missing husband came home, but I just know it isn't him. My husband went missing six months ago. Just went out to work one day and never came home. It was a horrible shock to the whole neighborhood because things like that just didn't happen in our little slice of white picket fence suburbia. The police launched an investigation, and the neighborhood watch sent out search parties. But no one ever found any evidence to indicate what had happened to him. Our families were devastated. Recently, the missing posters have been taken down or papered over. The updates from the police became less frequent and dwindled away. I accepted that. Hard as it was to admit, my Rick wasn't coming back. Until he did. A week ago, I was in the back garden watering my petunias when I heard the garden gate creak open. I jerked my head in that direction and there he was. Exactly the same as he was the day he disappeared. Same windswept blonde hair and bright blue eyes. Same curl to his pink lips. I was in shock. Our families had mourned for him. And yet there he was, standing in our garden like he had just popped out for milk or something. When I asked where he had been, he said he didn't know. He couldn't remember anything about the last six months. All our family and friends are beside themselves with joy. They almost can't believe it. But that's just the thing. I don't believe it. Look, I understand how crazy this all sounds. I do. Our families would never believe me. And I can't go to the police unless I want to end up in a straitjacket but I just know that the man sleeping next to me isn't my husband. I don't know what to do. I know I should be happy, but I'm not. I'm terrified. I don't know much about anything supernatural or paranormal. I don't even like watching horror movies. But something about this whole situation makes my skin crawl. Just let me explain why I'm so sure. Once I've done that, hopefully one of you will believe me and you'll be able to tell me what to do. The morning after Rick came home, I made him a cup of tea. When I handed it to him, he gave me the brightest smile. Then he took a sugar cube from the dish on the table and dropped it into the cup. Our house was in chaos with his return, and I was still in shock, so I didn't think much of it at the time, but it's been replaying in my mind ever since. I know it doesn't sound very significant, but my husband never put sugar in his tea. He was always adamant that it ruined the taste, and he'd get so frustrated if I ever put sugar in his cup by accident. And yet, this man had sugar. Then it was the golf. A few days ago when he was out visiting his mom, I recorded a golf tournament that was showing on the TV. It was one of Rick's favorite golfers that was competing, and he never missed it. Once, he even skipped out on an anniversary dinner just to watch a championship. Only when he came home from his parents and I told him what I'd done, he just seemed unbothered. Like, he said thanks and everything. And then he asked if I wanted to get dinner. He didn't even watch it, and that's just so out of character for him. Then one night I woke up around 2 a.m. to see Rick's face, inches from mine, just looking at me with these blank eyes. I kind of gave this nervous laugh and asked, Baby, what are you doing? And he didn't answer for like a solid 30 seconds. He just stared, almost like he was looking right through me. Then he suddenly smiled and said, Sorry, honey. Sometimes I just can't believe this is real. Then he just rolled over and went to sleep. I didn't get much sleep after that myself. Yesterday, about a week after he came home, the neighborhood threw a street party to celebrate his return. Everyone from our street and the streets on either side turned up to see him and tell him how happy they are that he's all right. When he wasn't standing with his arm around my waist, he was milling around chatting amicably to each and every one of our neighbors, even the little kids. Jackson, our next door neighbor Sally's toddler, wanted to play peekaboo, and Rick happily played along with a smile on his face. Now my husband never did that. Rick always said he didn't like kids. That's why we never had any and so he never wanted to play with any of the neighborhood children. Especially not Jackson. Rick all but avoided him. Before he disappeared, I had started to suspect it was so I wouldn't see them together and notice the subtle but unmistakable similarities. The final nail in the coffin, proverbially speaking, was Sally. Just this morning she came knocking on our door. Her excuse was the tray of brownies she carried, 
but I think she just wanted to push her way into our morning so that she could see for herself what the situation was. After she left, I called her a nosy busybody. Rick laughed, kissed my head, and agreed with me. That was when I knew for sure that it couldn't really be him. Rick always used to get so mad whenever I insulted Sally, like I didn't have any right to hate her even though she'd been fucking my husband for years. But today there was none of that. He didn't even try to defend her. I know what you must be thinking. If he was in an accident or something, he might have had some kind of traumatic brain injury that caused him to forget some things about his life, maybe even change his personality. And that's a valid, reasonable explanation. I have no doubt it's what the police would tell me if I reported all this. But you know why I'm dead certain that man isn't my husband? He doesn't have a scar. If he was really Rick, he'd have a scar on the side of his forehead shaped like the golf club I hit him with. But there's nothing. Not a mark. Honestly, I'm this close to going out tonight and digging up my petunias just to make sure he's still under there. I don't know what I'm sharing a bed with, but I know it's not my husband. So what the hell am I going to do? Hi, everyone. I want to thank you all for your concern and support. Even though I'm not giving out my real name, I obviously took a huge risk by telling anyone this at all and I'm so grateful you've all tried to be helpful. I'm so sorry for the delay in updating. I, well, I've had some things to figure out. So I'll start with what I know. My husband is dead. In the end, I decided not to dig up the petunias. It was a rash, unadvisable notion which I have since abandoned because I realized how much worse things could get if I was caught. I've been smart about the whole thing so far, and I'm not about to throw that all away. It's too big of a risk. I did, however, thoroughly examine the flowers and the earth around them for any sign of disturbance. But I found none. Of course I found none. I don't know what I thought had happened. That my garden was some sort of pet cemetery and my husband had clawed his way back from the beyond. Even to me, of all people, that sounds crazy. No, my husband is dead. In my heart, I know that beyond any shadow of a doubt which means that whoever is in my kitchen right now is a complete stranger. He looks and sounds exactly like Rick. His own parents don't even notice the difference, for heaven's sake, but he doesn't act like him at all, which tells me again that he is a stranger, that he never knew me before this, and he certainly never knew Rick. He doesn't enjoy the things Rick enjoyed. He doesn't say the sort of things Rick said. He doesn't complain, doesn't raise his voice, doesn't lie or gaslight or cheat. Frankly, he's a better husband than Rick ever was. Honestly, when I think about it like that, I'm almost tempted just to let it go. I tried to let it go, not to get caught up in worrying and just accept my new life for what it is. But I find myself unable to let it go. Because even though this man seems ordinary and kind and reasonable, there's one thing that scares me still. For someone to have so confidently taken Rick's place, they would somehow have to be sure themselves that the real Rick would not return to complicate their plans, however innocent or sinister those plans may be. Whoever this man is who is calling himself Rick, he must surely know that Rick is dead. And if he knows that, I would bet anything that he also knows how. I've gambled with my life and my freedom before, and I don't intend to do so again. A couple of you suggested that Rick might have had a twin that, for whatever reason, I never knew about, or perhaps a doppelganger who saw his chance at a more comfortable life and took it. Either of these seemed to me to be the closest to the realm of possibility, so they were the first theories I set out to confirm or disprove. A DNA test would surely be able to confirm whether this man is my husband's twin or someone completely unrelated. Of course, I was hardly going to tell him about it. At best, he would refuse, and at worst, well... I didn't want to find out. So about a week after my last post, I ordered two separate DNA tests designed for finding one's relatives and ancestors and had them delivered whilst Rick was at work. Then, a few nights later, I waited until he was asleep. Actually asleep, not half asleep and staring. And I pulled out a few strands of his hair, 
Not enough that it would be noticeable in the morning, but sufficient amount to send away in a little tube to be analyzed. Much to my relief, he didn't wake up. I'm not sure how I would have explained it if he had. I sent the hair away to the DNA test companies, and they told me I'd have to wait a couple of weeks for the results. And in those couple of weeks, things have gotten... stranger, shall we say. You see, I've noticed that Rick never seems to eat of his own accord. Like, he'll make dinner for us both, but that seems more to do with when I mention that I'm hungry than with his own desire to eat. He doesn't snack between meals. He never goes for a glass of water. I don't even think he takes anything with him to work for lunch. There's something else, too. Rick's beard trimmer is still in its box, exactly where he left it six months ago, covered in dust and quite obviously unused. And yet, Rick has been home for nearly a month, and his beard doesn't seem to be any longer, even though he used to trim it twice a week. On top of that, the staring has become a frequent occurrence, and not just in the middle of the night. I catch him watching me during the day, too, always looking away or laughing it off whenever I notice him doing it. Anyway, I might as well tell you why I'm writing this now, because I can't make head nor tail of the situation anymore. The DNA tests came back in the mail this afternoon, before Rick came home from work. I opened them quickly, eager to see who was included in the list of relatives, whether there were any names I recognized. Either way, it would answer my question. Only, I don't have an answer. All I have are more questions. Because the first test came back as inconclusive, with a note from the company telling me I had to send them a viable hair sample in order for it to work. I didn't understand that. I'd cut the hair myself, after all. And what did they mean by viable? But it was the second test that concerned me the most, where there should have been information about demographic and regional origin. There was nothing. Only a line of printed black letters spelling out the word unknown. Where there should have been a list of relatives and ancestors, there was no one. Not just no one related to Rick. No, I mean no one. According to the DNA test, this man has no relatives, no family, no ancestors, no biological connections, near or distant. That should be impossible, right? How can a person exist without any kind of relation? And how can he come from nowhere? I'm typing this up on the computer in the study, with several tabs open on various Google searches as I try to figure out how this could be possible. The DNA test lies on the table behind me, taunting me with the evidence of everything I do not know. And then I hear it, clear as day, coming from the doorway behind me. Rebecca, if I didn't know better, I'd say my heart stopped. I would know that voice anywhere. I never heard him come in, never even heard the door open. Dimly in the back of my mind, I recall that our door creaks every time it opens. How could I not have heard it? I turn over my shoulder towards not Rick, a false, bright smile on my face. He is not smiling. His face is calm, but there's something hard about the line of his mouth that sets me on edge. What the hell is this? His voice is perfectly level, but something about it makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There's an undertone to his voice that I haven't noticed before now, something low and subtly grating. Even the real Rick never sounded like that. He holds something up, one eyebrow arched. When I see what he's holding, my stomach plummets. The results of the DNA test. <laughs>